on salvage hunters. <laughs> At a boatyard in Warwickshire, Drew's tempted by some eclectic objects. Are they for sale before we go any further? They belong to the missus. Uh, everything's for <laughs> sale. <laughs> At a castle in Staffordshire. How are you doing? I'm really good to Should see I... you. Of course. <laughs> an eccentric character makes a royal demand. I'd want you to make me an offer on it, but I wouldn't be looking at three or four hundred. I'd be looking quite a lot more. And in the Lake District, Drew wishes he'd stuck to antiques. Ow! Yeah, they've got antiques on this off scooby food. <laughs> Drew Pritchard is one of Britain's leading decorative salvage dealers. Well, that's pretty spectacular. Oh, God, that's fantastic. Beautiful. He scours the country in search of weird and wonderful objects. For treasure, he bargains hard. 950. It's too much money. You're after 600 quid. Yeah. Yeah. Done. And there's nothing he won't buy. Oh, yeah, look at that. I love him. With help from Rebecca. That's uh, really flat. cool. Oh, not I love it. And a team of renovators. He transforms thousands of items from junk to gems. Salvage Supremo Drew Pritchard's business runs on finding desirable, stylish and curious objects. We'll get them packed, uh, ready for shipping out. They'll be with you within the week. They often find some of the most unusual things come from the most eccentric dealers. The antiques world does attract the eccentric because you don't have to conform. Huge attraction for me in the business. Drew has a reputation for buying the weird and the wonderful. And he loves nothing more than visiting eccentric people and unusual locations in the hunt for off-the-wall objects. It actually is really useful for Drew to go and meet unusual people that are collectors because they tend to have a sort of unblinkered, eclectic way of buying. And Drew often comes back with something that's a little bit quirky and it's perfect for our look. Today, Drew is travelling 180 miles from Plandidno to Keswick in the Lake District. He's been invited to look over some antiques at a country house estate. Terry Barlow, and he is the alpaca breeder on the estate, and he collects antiques as well. <laughs> I mean, it is a bit random, isn't it? Naturally, we'd go together, I'd have thought. Well, yeah. Odd calls like this can be brilliant. When you don't know, and it's in a really odd location, I've turned up some of the best pieces. You know, you've gone for one thing and found another. The dramatic fells and majestic waterways around Keswick have inspired generations of artists and writers. Beatrix Potter holidayed here as a girl, staying at the magnificent Lingham Estate. The house and its setting provided inspiration for her best-selling animal-themed children's books. Continuing the animal idea, an alpaca guided tours company recently... When I left the army, the armed forces, I got into security with all the stresses that involves. Basically went to an agricultural show and we seen uh, two alpacas, didn't have a clue what they was. I thought it was sort of very giraffes. I've got a herd now of 48 alpacas. Started doing tours around Lingham Estate, uh, where we take alpacas around the grounds, Beatrix Potter. So it's turned out a little great adventure. It's grown organically and it's uh, now my life. Terry's other passion is antiques, many of which are stored in the nearby stables. He's not a traditional dealer, so Drew's hoping the items won't be traditional either. I'm attracted to sort of unusual items, really. Things that stand out. I'm looking forward to Drew coming down and tea, just having a look around my antiques, seeing what he thinks about it, and um, hopefully make a few sales. All right, see? Away in. Lingham House is a Grade 2 listed 19th century national treasure, sporting an eclectic mix of styles and designs. Although Drew knows he won't be bidding on items from the main house, he can't resist a quick tour. Oh yeah, look at this. Oh, fabulous. Unusual combination and mixture of styles. That's a leather wall, yeah? Yeah. It's embossing. I think it's yeah. Italian, isn't it? It's gonna be, yeah, it's all listed with the building. It's yeah. original. Strange, though, then you've got that chimney piece there that just doesn't work with the rest of it and then you've got pitch pine there and all this is pitch pine in a sort of a watered down English arts and crafts gothic E thing going on. The house has got a very strange mixture of styles that staircase section there, okay that's pure arts and crafts, that is the ceiling and then everything else, nothing matching mirrors 
That's fabulous. Look at that. That is a piece of work. Well, that's like Scottish baronial gothic. It's a cracking thing, that is. Do you does, see does look good there. Not like that. Not like that. I've never bought one like that before. It's so well made. It's absolutely fabulous. I'd be very happy to own that. Drew's had a good look round this intriguing house, but nothing in here is Terry's to sell. So it's time to head for the stables, where he stores his collection of antiques. So, snip in here, guys. It's a bit dark, so be careful. <laughs> it's actually got a horse in it as well. <laughs> I wasn't expecting that. What did you pay, about 1,500 quid? I paid 1,800 for it. And, uh, and get it, I had to get it over from the Netherlands. It's just something a bit different. What's to go? Anything in there can go. Quite like that little cabinet at the back there. Yeah. And I like those eagles there as well. What sort of money are they? What would you What would you think? They're not old ones. Yeah. They're um, not old ones. They're sort of seven, 1970s ones. Yeah. Just but nice of a very, of, like of a very well-known original. I think it was made by uh, Austin and Seeley. These stone eagles are usually made to sit on a pillar and protect it from rain damage. They're 20th century copies of originals by the firm Austin and Seeley, one of the 19th century's leading statue makers, who used an innovative, long-lasting stone substitute. These birds are a handed pair, looking left and right, and could be worth around 900 pounds. Christmas of the carving. When you look at some garden statues, they look like they've almost melted, whereas Austin and Seeley's stuff was so well cast in the first place, it almost looked like stone. We're looking at 300 odd? No, I can't, I can't do it. I can't can't do. What, what can you do? I, I could do double that 600. Six? I can't go to six. I can't go to six. I paid five for them. Joe could have given me what I paid for him. I'll tell you what, I don't want you to do that. Well, let's, let's, let's do the gentleman thing, five and a half. Yeah, brilliant. Yes, yeah. oh, yeah. thank you. Lovely. Ideally, I'd want to pay four, four and a half for them, max, max. But I think I can get a turn on them. And what about the single dog you've got left? Yeah, self, self for sale. And what's that? Is that sort of arts and craftsy looking Yeah, that's thing? A, an arts that? and crafts. I believe it was from Liberty, and it's a, an arts and crafts smoking cabinet. Can we pull that out as well? Yeah, of course we can. Uh, I don't know what... It burnt down with one of their ears. <laughs> <laughs> You're joking. <laughs> I'm not saying that. Though. But, yeah, so it's a bit rare. Terry clearly is a real enthusiast for this stuff. Shows a, a bit of high level of confidence as well in his buying. Very brave what he's been buying. He's not buying things for £50, you know, he's buying things for thousands. He should be possibly looking at a career in the antiques trade, you never know. Well, and, um, what's it made out of? It's, it's a bronze, but apparently a Chinese bronze with a lot of large mix of copper in it. Yeah, yeah. How much is he? I could do it for 600. He's going to be staying here. OK, right. that's right, that's fine. Terry, if nothing else, likes the, the weird and wonderful, the strange, highly decorative. It's not the norm. The cabinet at the back there, as well. Yeah, so it's an old dentist table, isn't it? I yep. just love the colours on them. Yeah, I like this brown. Yeah, that's unusual. Just stands out, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. How much is that one? What would you like to pay? Kick off 150 quid. I, I can do 250. I think it's worth 295. I'd have to pay 250. I'd have, right, have to sell it for 375. I did two. That's round about where I was at with it. Not sure. Right, keep it aside. Not sure. Not sure on that one. Tell you what, I, let's keep it aside. That, here. that thing there. Can we get that out yeah, as well? What on earth? I'm not seeing that. Which one? Is that a dentist's cabinet? Oh, yeah, this is pretty rare. Yeah, it's pretty cool. I love it. It's just, it reminds me of the old Star Wars. It's got that sort of... Yeah, the first Star, the first yeah, the first Star Wars. Yeah, yeah. It's got that sort of feel to it. old metal dentist cabinet is called the Gyrator. It was made in France by Leon Marta, and this model dates from the 1950s. The cylindrical chest contains 18 drawers and four curved glass doors and rotates for easy access to instruments while attending to a patient. These tables are quite rare, and it could be worth around £1,500. This is an odd piece of furniture. It was made for one purpose. It wasn't made to sort of work in a house. You've got to think pretty much out of the box about using this in a residential environment. I really haven't got a clue what somebody's going to do with it, but it's cool, and that's enough. Well, they do go for good money. I've not seen one. Yeah, it's, uh, it's super rare. So you've got an idea what you want for it then? Yeah, I would want about 2000 for it. 
is on the Lingham Estate in the Lake District. He's looking through a stable full of antiques with ex-soldier and alpaca keeper Terry Barlow. It's actually got a horse in it as well. <laughs> I wasn't expecting that. Drew is trying to do a deal on an unusual dentist cabinet, and Terry is trying to extract as much money for it as possible. I would want about 2000 for it. I'd be wanting to sell it for just under 2000 it's very transparent because it goes on my website. You can see what I'm going to sell it for. Yeah, yeah, you know, no, it's, it's not. Sort of, no, no, yeah, I need to uh, There's only so much I can get yeah, for it, you can. know. How about 1200 That's coming down a bit. Oh, yeah, that's coming down a lot. Yeah. But then you've got, if you're only selling it for that, that's an easy one. I'll always make some money on it, so. Like, well, are you making money on that? Yeah, we're making a couple hundred quid. Tell you what, then. I'll give you that. Yeah, awesome. Can't wait to see that on your website. Yeah. The two medical cabinets will be sold separately. One for quite a small figure, the other one's going to be at least £2,000. The smaller one will go privately and they, people use them in their bathrooms and bedrooms or as drinks, trolleys. The larger one is going, to ha it's going to end up going somewhere quite special. Where? I have no clue. Terry's eccentric taste in antiques certainly captured Drew's interest and now he wants to visit Terry's other consuming passion. Right, so what are we off to see now? Your alpacas? Yeah, I'll give you a quick tour around them, introduce them to you. They're quite big, aren't they? Do they spit at you? This is Boo. Boo. Hello, yeah. Boo. Hey, buddy. Ooh, ow. Yeah, they've got bottom teeth, ow, so they sort ow, of scoop ow. food. <laughs> looking at an alpaca, man, they're human Muppet faces. They're odd looking, you know. Um, one of them's a bit too friendly, though, so you can back off. I'm going to start naming them after Star Wars characters, like uh, Chewpacca. Uh, I like what you've done there, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> We get calls to stately homes and churches, cathedrals. But when you get a call to meet an alpaca farmer in the Lake District, it's up there. It's up there with the odd ones. And it's paid off. I knew he'd love the dentist table. And anything unusual, I'm sure, most dealers were there. It's what they go for. I'm actually quite glad I didn't buy my horse. And I do love my horse. Uh, and I would find a hard line to go. You couldn't have picked a more random pile of bits there, could you, than no. that. And today does prove the point that you do have to go. It's a three-hour drive back to the warehouse to offload the bizarre range of antiques. Hello. Hello. Hello, hello, hello. Well, um, how... Alpacas. Yes. Alpacas. Now, this is unusual, <laughs> taken to this it's... tenth degree. <laughs> He's an alpaca farmer who was really into antiques. He was a really nice guy, wasn't he? Oh, yeah, top fella. So these are a pair of gate finial eagles. Yeah, they're um, nice. They're not very old. They're probably 30, 40 years old max. Doesn't matter. And they are copies of the originals which were made by Austin and Seeley. We paid five fifty for the pair. There's nothing to do, and the patina on them is It's superb. perfect. Reproduction statues don't tend to falls off or a leg falls off it's quite common to see them in a really bad state so for drew to come back with a matching pair in perfect condition is superb a little medical oh. unusual color very a bit battered but it was cheap but that and this which is apparently extremely rare oh i love this isn't it fabulous it needs a lot of work we need to get the handles redone. There's yeah. quite a few broken and some missing oh, no. ones. Yeah, that has unfortunately happened in transit. Oh, uh, naughty boy. Naughty T. T didn't tie this trolley securely in the van. And one of the panes has broken in the little door. And it's not a flat pane. It's a curved pane. So that's a... Three, four hundred quid on it. I can't wait to see that, Dad. Straight into your workshop, please, go in. There's two days you're not going to get back. <laughs> the medical table goes off to the workshop with expert restorers Gavin and Carl for some cosmetic surgery. If you sort the glass out on the shelves, I'm going to start making the handles. Gavin is making a replica of the missing handle. I'm just going to use this um, hardwood, draw around the existing, cut it out, and shape it to match. He cuts the rough shape with an electric jigsaw, then thins and smooths it using a sander. Is that a coat of black paint now, then, Stick it on. Carl.
Carl is tasked with creating it. For photography purposes, we're going to put some perspex in. It'll curve the perspex with heat and then cool it down with screen wash so it retains the memory. I know it's sort of nearly there when it's too hot to touch but not burning my hands. Carl then sprays the temporary perspex pane with glass cleaner to cool it down quickly. One piece of shaped perspex. Quite cool, isn't it? Quirky. Different. Never seen one before, to be honest. My fair dues, I'm happy with that. For what little you did, you done well? Yeah, but it's the small things that added perfection, Gav. That's what you've been told for years. <laughs> while they wait for the new glass to... Which is remarkable, it really is. He's done a really, really good job on it. It's good, ready for a new home. Compulsive collectors often have some of the off-the-wall antiques Drew constantly seeks. He's going to see one of his favourite eccentric salvage collectors, who lives near Bedworth in Warwickshire. So we're off to see Pete at Charity Dock again. Oh, good. My third trip. All you can expect with Pete is the unexpected. He has Harley Davidson's through to 50s sort of shoebox, dreadful cars, through to washing machines, chainsaws, plastic pigs. Drew has visited Pete twice before. On both occasions, he found plenty he would like to buy, but found Pete reluctant to part with his best treasures. Go do a bit of work on it. I could save you all that hassle. What do you want for yeah, it? Yeah, no. Oh, I've got to have me enjoyment first. Do you sell me anything you actually, actually want. really, really, really want? He won't sell me anything I really want, that's for sure. He's got some bikes and scooters I'd like to buy, and there's no way he's going to sell those. Charity Dock is a boatyard that serves the river craft that sail on the Coventry Canal. It's become a well-known local landmark due to the artistic mountain of scrap and salvage collected over many years by owner Pete Gilbert. The great-granddad built it in about 1936, what we can make out. We've got a lot of things from farm sales and then it's like the boats from there and parts from there. Anything that someone brought down and I took a shine to, I'd probably buy off them and keep it like. Instead of chucking some of the way, we might use it for another thing. And I used to travel up and down the canal and there, there are lots of yards like us, but they seem to clear them all up and put houses on them and everything's been changing, isn't it? Pete is a hard person to negotiate with, but Drew's never one to be defeated. He knows that there will be rare items hidden among the junk. It's not changed, has it? No, it's just a bit higher than it was. <laughs> Pete. Oh, Drew. Hello, mate. How are you? All right. Good to see you again. How are you? Take you well? How you doing? Good. Yeah. Right, we're going to try and buy something off you. Yeah, OK. Yeah. What I love about this place is lots and lots of things, but mainly that it actually exists, that it's still here. Amongst all the homogenised, boring world that we now live in, this random two and a half acres of just mechanical madness that he's created here. I love it. Blimey. You've gone a bit mad on minis as well. Yeah. What else have you been buying? There's a, um, a shell there. We'll what, what's that front. wing off? Is that off a... Uh, uh, there's, two, there's two wings. I think they're off Bentleys. Hang on, before I go wandering over there, you're not going to sell them, are you? Salvage expert Drew Pritchard is paying a visit to one of his favourite places, the Charity Dock Boatyard in Warwickshire. Oh, Drew. He's hoping headstrong owner Pete Gilbert is in the mood to part with some of the unusual salvage he's accrued over the years. What's that wing off? Is that off a... Uh, there's, that? Two, there's two wings. I think they're off Bentleys. Hang on, before I go wandering over there, you're not going to sell them, are you? Yeah. You are? Yeah. I ain't got Bentley. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're handmade. What do I need those for? They're Bentley. Bentley, Bentley. Uh... This pair of car wings date from the early 1950s. They were made by the leading luxury coach building firm, H.J. Mulliner of London. They could have been fitted to a Rolls-Royce Silver Wraith, or more probably for the Mark VI Bentley and the subsequent R-Type. 
They could be worth around three. Please. What do you know that I don't know? Are they not worth anything? I don't know. Are they worth a lot more then? I don't know. No, I just I thought they're Bentley, aren't they? They're yeah. Bentley, they're handmade, they're alloy. Yeah. There you go. Well, there's one. I have to buy them. They're so beautiful in a, in a strange way. I don't know what exactly I'm going to do with them. The best thing I could do, I've got a client who is a Bentley and Rolls Royce specialist in North Wales. So I should just stick them in the car and take them to them and say, what are these worth to you? It's a fantastic start for Drew, and the yard is peppered with vintage motor salvage. Pete, it's still there. I know. Why have you taken the front off? Because it's getting a bit of rot round it, so we're going to have it in the workshop. You <laughs> said you were going to do this five years oh, no. ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is it for sale yet? No, no. I forgot all about this. <laughs> Last time I was here, Pete had just acquired this Piaggio three-wheeler pickup. And I wanted to buy it off him then. And he goes, no, let me have my fun with it, and then I'll sell it to you. It hasn't moved. I completely get Pete. About 99% of it. 1% is he doesn't sell stuff, and that I don't get. Just imagine if you weighed in all the scrap here. Just the sheer volume. He could retire very, very comfortably, but he don't want to. Everywhere Drew looks is piled high with layers of potentially lucrative salvage. He's determined to keep pushing on and get another deal out of Pete. I don't know which way to go next. Which way's best? Down here, into yeah, the boatyard? Probably, yeah. Well, okay. I'll tell you what's around there. You have a look. There's yeah. a couple of leather horses. As we wander around, Pete says, oh, I've got some leather horses in here. It's like uh, the missus. She's not told me, but she found them somewhere. I don't know. Grab that for Pete. Yeah. Are they for sale before we go any further? Can yeah, go? yeah, these are. I'm strange. They belong to the missus. Uh, everything's for <laughs> sale. <laughs> Legs are a bit. Yeah. Ben, it's all Mr. Bob. Uh. <laughs> These leather horses were made in the 1970s. They represent a mare and a stallion, with bodies made from a lightweight wood and covered in a patchwork of brown leather. Animal figures are very collectible, and these could be worth around £275 each. I've um, 150 quid for the pair, grab you. I'll put it to her. That's quite a fair bit, I think. Yeah, I'll put it to her, I'll give her a ring and see. OK, let's carry on. Yeah. With salvage stacked up as far as keep his wits about him. It's just got fuller by almost 50% more, so it's hard to see through everything now. Before, it was a little clearer and I was able to buy quite easily, but now this is tough. There's just so much stuff. This looks relatively tidy. So sort of tough. Oh, hello. You got a 90. There's a couple of them. Among the paraphernalia, eagle-eyed Drew has spotted a pair of Honda mopeds. One red, one blue, and something seems familiar. First motorbike or scooter I ever had was a practically as new condition, blue and white, C50. And I got it off a, a bin man in Clan Roost for about, took the mud guards off it and, and, and then razzed it around and wrecked it in no time at all and then swapped what remains for a 125, DT125. So, uh, yes, um, I utterly ruined the first one I had. What are you doing with these, with these, then? Yeah, uh, well, I suppose... I'm Do they run? The blue one runs, and... What about, and what about the red one? That's, That's the I'm, earliest one, by the way. Yeah, I've not tried that, but... Did it turn? Turn over? No, no. It's so frozen? I, I don't know that, so I've never looked at it, really. I chucked it in here and left it. What do you want from? I don't know. I don't know what's that worth, about 500 quid. Is it 500 quid for both of them? No. Come on. <laughs> no. Price on the C90 is just 500 quid. He's a thing with it, you know. Um, but he's not hes not budging, really. I mean, getting a price off him, that was good. You know, it's, it's hard just to get a price sometimes. I'm tempted, but I can't pay 500 quid for them. No, I'll leave those. Leave those. As Drew's engine isn't firing over the bike, he wants to check out the dry dock shed, where Pete still runs a boat maintenance service. This is testing me. I'm trying to find something in this lot. Do people still bring you stuff? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's Brutus? Yeah, it's an old sign off a, a boat we had in. It's a few years ago, that is now. This hand-painted boat sign is made of plywood. It has no great age and is simply a fun decorative item. 
Is that for sale? Yeah. What do you want for it? Turn up. Any good? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. There you go. I'm better for looking at it now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it has got a bit of Coventry on the bottom of it. Where it's all right. It's, uh... That's all right. Yeah. yeah, I like it. It's cool. It's just so basic. While Drew carries on searching, Pete makes a call to his wife. Elaine, uh, them horses you've got, do you want to sell them? Uh, he's offered 150 for them. Oh, you want a bit more? I'll see if he'll go a bit more on them. Try them. Ah, what's she say? Uh, I've had Feel? a word with her. She wants a little bit. Trying to hand me a horse so you yeah, can shake hands. That's it. <laughs> That'll do. Cheers then. Thank you. Job done. And you're still not going to sell that? No, no, not yet. Next time, Drew. No, you said that last time. You said oh, you'll well, have your fun yeah. out of it, and then I can buy it. <laughs> it's been coined this place now as Britain's biggest man draw. He's never going to sell any of this stuff, and he'll need several lifetimes to complete all of the projects that he's got on here. Some people would look at this and think, the guy's lost the plot, it's eccentric, odd, uncomfortable for him to live in. It's not. It's got a lovely life down here. Individual, I think is the best way of putting it. Plays with the money, it's all, you know, helps things out a bit. It all won't go to me. <laughs> Without doubt, the most random selection of items we've ever bought. Leather horses, an old ship sign, and a pair of wings off a of Bentley. It's always nice to come visit Pete, though, isn't it? Yeah. Is his yard full? It's full. Okay. He's going to have to sell something to get something else in there. No, he's got all that sky to go up into. All the stuff's going to start getting damaged because he's just going to have stuff lying on top of other things. Bothered <laughs> The boys are not going straight back to Wales. The next day, they head to Staffordshire. The English aristocracy have a long history of eccentricity and collecting antiques. And Drew and T are heading to a site of national historical importance. To Tutbury Castle today to meet a lady called Leslie, who took the castle on. And it's a castle that I know absolutely nothing about at all. I never heard of it. But um, the place is open to the public. You know what that's like. They're always looking for funds and cool things to have a look. All we have to do is get lucky. That's it, really. Tutbury Castle was built in the 11th century and destroyed following a 1647 Act of Parliament after the Civil War. In the late 1500s, Mary, Queen of Scots, was held prisoner here four times. Drew is meeting Mary's nemesis, Elizabeth I, recreated by the castle's curator, Leslie Smith. I've been curator here at Tutbury Castle for 18 years. The wrists of the dead and pull them out of the walls, but not as zombies, as living people who come towards you and tell you about their lives. And therefore I decided to become Elizabeth I and Mary Queen of Scots and various other characters so people could come and actually meet them. It's very beautiful, isn't it? It really is. I think I can hold my own with Drew. Look at me, I beat the Spanish Armada. It's going to be no problem. <laughs> Hello. Drew, <laughs> how, how are you? Are you? <laughs> I'm flabbergasted. <laughs> nice to meet you. How are you doing? I'm really good to Should see I... you. Of course. <laughs> I am. I'm team male. <laughs> Very glad to see you. Wow. Come on That's in. fabulous. Is this what they all wear around it? All the time. <laughs> Meeting Leslie was a bit of a shock. Nobody, <laughs> we have never met somebody. Really? These stairs, yeah, they're behind an airing cupboard. It does take you a little bit to that place, doesn't it? When you're dealing with somebody who would have had white lead dust all over their face, would have had a big bouffant hair, you know, would have had this incredible presence in the room. I think Leslie's pretty much got it. Wow, look at this. I never knew about this place. Well, you know, it's a beautiful secret. But more and more people are discovering it. It was known as the Lock of the North. Really? Mary Queen of Scots was a prisoner. So why have I not heard of this place? Why? It's been in a very deep sleep since the Victorian period. And then I took it over at the end of 1999. People said, don't do it, it's got no roof, you're mad. And I said, yeah, but think what's been here. And so I had a very big dig on with the British Museum. We did an enormous job looking under the ground, finding cobble streets, courtyards, 
historical pieces to furnish the castle. We've got some lovely things for you to look at. Yeah, look at all this stuff. This is a show-off piece. This is not for fighting in. No. And you can lift that out both sides so you can walk away and get on a horse. Not necessarily in that not order. Not at the same time. No. you <laughs> give <laughs> Look at that, nice Herbert. Piece, wow. I know, so rare. I've never seen one. We think it came out of a church because the feet are so clean and flat and dry. Houses, as you know, had rushes and we and yeah. all sorts of things. But it's a fabulous piece. Some people say 1490s. Um, Has anybody mentioned it possibly being cut in half? No, um, they haven't. That's not, that's not finished correctly. No, it's odd, isn't it? Yeah. But at the same time, it is, of course, very early. So that, see the way that's been, uh, this was much taller. larger, taller, yeah. You know your stuff very well, of course you do, I don't mean that to sound patronising, of course you do, but everything you tell me is helpful. I just love the form of it, I think that's the bit that really attracts me to it. It's exceptionally original, I've never seen one before. Value-wise, I've got no idea, but it's not hundreds, I think it would probably run into early thousands, one or two thousand pounds if it came on the open market. So that's, so that's not for sale? I'm afraid that is, and that's right, part okay. of my approach. No. OK, so obviously there's not much for sale in here. What about these lovely carpets? These two, I know, are good, really yeah. good. Mm. And they are for sale at the right price. They are? Mm -hmm. And there's a reason for it, mm. which is we have a lot of the general public come here now in large numbers. And they're just getting worn. And they're getting worn. And I think it's time for them to go to a private house or a private collection. Have, have you had them valued? Because carpets is something, it's like... Um, Highly specialised. Oh, good luck in Getting nowhere. Year. Good luck Getting nowhere with it. Uh, no, I haven't, but I know some, when some Buddhist monks came here, they did say, this is very important and early. These rugs are over 100 years old. They're made from sheep's wool, dyed with natural plants or insect-derived colourants. They're hand-knotted and flat-woven, meaning they have a flat surface with no pile. Some rare old rugs sell for upwards of tens of thousands of pounds, but less intricate ones might only be worth a few hundred. The rugs will need further investigation to determine their age, origin and value. For me, I'm purely looking at them as a decorative antique. And what I can rather say, than a collective piece. Rather, rather than a collectible piece, I'd have to find out about them. I'd want you to make me an offer on it, but I wouldn't be looking at three or four hundred. Salvage Supremo Drew Pritchard is looking for antiques at the medieval Tutbury Castle in Staffordshire. Wow. I know, so rare. Isn't it exciting? It is. Eccentric curator Leslie Smith has just offered to sell him two of her antique rugs. I'd want you to make me an offer on it, but I wouldn't be looking at three or four hundred. I'd be looking quite a lot more. No, I, I'd, I'd be starting at a thousand pounds. Yes. Pair. I think it's probably about right, and I'd probably be. I, I'm, it's all guesswork, and I'd probably top out at twelve hundred because I don't know enough. It's a risk that we both take. I don't take know. It, but I know you have a reputation of being very fair. The reality of it is, I think that one is probably worth a four or five hundred, yeah. but that's worth a lot more. I mean, that's... But how much more? That's so, that one there seems 19th century. And so, therefore, I would certainly be wanting a thousand for this. So you're talking more like 1,500? Yeah, but that's all for the two. If it's not for you, it's not for you. I just Can we do 1,400? Purely because I just like the figure. Thank you. There's definite profit in them, that's for sure, but they're also going to be really nice things to own and handle and learn about. That's the main thing. My initial thing when I bought them wasn't, right, let's sell them, which is unusual. I want to hang on to these and understand them a bit more. So I'm paying for my education on these. I'm learning. And I'm treading on your skirt as well. <laughs> I'm the Virgin Queen. I'm quite used to mentioning them. That's quite used to that. With one purchase prized away from Leslie's personal collection, it's time to look. It's that important. And I bought something really good. So, yes, a fabulous day. And it was great meeting the Queen. I have to say, hats off to Leslie. She obviously genuinely loves it as well. You have, I mean, passion you have to have a massive passion for that era because you don't do that for the money, you do that for the love of it. That's for sure. I think we bought something very nice. The carpet. I think we paid up for it. Yeah? Yeah. I think we did. But, you know, I've got very lucky on a couple of carpets in the past, so I'll take a chance. You should reword that. What's that? That you got very lucky on a couple of carpets in the past. <laughs> The 
boys barrel back to Clandid. These. Now, these are a bit good. Now, perfect. this one is the earlier one. So, this one's 19th century or earlier. I've been buying a lot of carpets recently and I'm learning about them quickly. So, it's a flat weave, um, vegetable dye, wool, pure wool. That's all I know about it. So basically what I did, I paid a thousand quid for this one and yeah. 400 quid for that one. Look at his face. <laughs> <laughs> that one's going to get most of the money back. And then we need to learn about that this one. That's this one. This yeah. is a special one, That's isn't it? That's a special one, yeah. The castle, uh, slim pickings on this one, but potentially we could have something with those rugs. We can see Pete, charity doc. Still won't sell through what he wants. Richard. Ten quid, old boat sign. That was quite cool. Oh. It's a nice little gift. Somebody will buy it for somebody. Somebody might, out there might have a dog call people back to our website because they never know what to expect. And the low prices, the quirkiness, it all works. Oh, we've never had horses before. Nope, never. Ever. They don't stand up. They don't stand up, poor old things. You've put money on worse than this, haven't you? <laughs> <laughs> There's a... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> they move faster than what I yeah. want. <laughs> £175 the pair. Not every day are we going to sell sort of a Chippendale chair or a, or a Howard chair. You know, tomorrow we're going to sell two horses. The horses go to French polisher and carpenter Alex. Drew has decided the pair should be mounted on a wooden plinth. They're a little bit wobbly, they don't stand up, so they can't be sold like that if they can't be displayed. It's a snag. What I'm finding is on the, the joint of the, the foot and the leg, there's something quite hard that the drill doesn't want to go through. You see, we've got metal fragments coming out of there. We may need to look at a different way of mounting these. Made of thin, curved wood, the legs are delicate and over-drilling could snap them. Alex has to make a decision about how to proceed. Well, I'm wondering if we could, yeah, put some sort of wooden support I might have to try and drill into the poor thing's tail. Doesn't look impressed. <laughs> Alex now drills a small hole at the base of the tail and cuts a length of thin dowel to size and glues one end into the new base. This will stick solid. The other end of the wood with old. And takes a blowtorch to the edge of the base to weather and roughen it. That's ready to go. That's pretty good. Very delicate. We couldn't have done any less to it, really. You know, we've done bare minimum, so there's, you know, it doesn't take away from the actual, the horse itself. Yeah, very happy with that. The horses, now stable on their oak plinth and shown off to best effect, swiftly gallop off to a buyer in the West Country. From Terry at Lingham Estate, the composite stone eagles flew off to a private buyer in Norfolk. And Rebecca has done some research into the two antique rugs from Queen Elizabeth at Tutbury Castle, which Drew paid £1,400 for. These rugs in their day were central Iran, and they're around 1900, 1910. They're worth around 400 for one and 150 for the other. It's part of the antique dealer's life. You win some, you lose some. The antiques world does attract the eccentric. You can buy whatever you like, you can wear whatever you like, you can do whatever you like. It's down to whether or not you have taste, style and a dealer's ability. And that does attract a certain type of free-thinking, artistic person. Mm -hmm.